good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Rage boils over in Quebec, with governments accused of responding too late. Can I lose my house? We get answers from Montreal's mayor. Expectations pile up for France's president-elect. One company's big bet that ketchup can be a Canadian value. Plus, leading-edge technology drives a Canadian company, drives it all the way to Germany. Does it bother you that this isn't happening in Canada? The battle against relentless flooding in Quebec and Ontario is now at its peak. Government aid is ramping up. More soldiers are on the ground. Water levels are now thought to be about as high as they're going to get. But for some, the extra help coping is simply too late and too little. Much of Gatineau looks like a dam. Dams and reservoirs are working overtime to slow the floodwaters that have displaced about 800 people. Buildings are being cut off from the power grid to prevent electrocutions. Huge numbers of sandbags have been distributed. The situation is not as bad in Ottawa, but it's still serious enough. All in all, the affected area is vast, from the capital region to the end of the Gas Bay Peninsula. We begin our coverage tonight with Alison Northcott near Montreal, where frustration is turning into fury. Provincial police, with help from the military, went into the flood zone in the town of Rigo, carrying out the municipality's mandatory evacuation order. It's very difficult for them to let go at this point. We want to make sure they're safe. Um, the water, they have generators running here with pumps uh, inside the homes. They're present inside the home. We're worried about the carbon monoxide. Stéphane Caron wanted to stay. He worked tirelessly for weeks to protect his home and says the worst was almost behind him. Rage, really rage. I feel rage about the mayor. Uh, no respect for the, for the citizens. He says he felt alone in his fight. Being forced to abandon it adds to his anger. Hurtful. <laughs> Very hurtful. I'm going to lose my house and no respect for the mayor. Oh. <laughs> Water levels in many areas are still high, but stabilizing, while the damage, the losses and the stress keep rising. In Montreal, on the West Island, this is Tanya Caro's street. She says help to protect her home was hard to come by. We never got our sandbags, by the way, which we had asked for all week long. The only one who helped me on this was the people as a neighbor, people from a school, but Montreal's mayor says firefighters and hundreds of city workers are on the ground 24 hours a day helping. The city, the province and the federal government say they are doing all they can in the face of historic flooding. We're just going to do what needs to be done. I, I just want people to know that. And we're not there uh, like accountants counting how much money is going to cost. Uh, people first. Flooded out homeowners can apply for financial aid from the province. And Ottawa has sent in the military to protect infrastructure, homes and roads. Help is also coming from people across the province rallying for their exhausted neighbours. We drive around, we look uh, to see if there are trucks that uh, they have sandbags and uh, if they do, we help them. But there have also been tragic consequences. In the Gaspé region, a two-year-old girl and a 37-year-old man were swept away by the water after the car they were in swerved into the river off of a road covered in water. <laughs> I told him not to cross that road, says the man's father, Jacques Gagnon. The water here in Rigo continues to rise, but it is slowing down. Authorities expect levels in many areas will finally begin to recede later this week. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Rigo, Quebec. The frustration and exhaustion are just as acute in the capital region. People in Ottawa are desperate not to share the fate of their neighbours in Gatineau where whole sections of that city are underwater. Ashley Burke takes us there. It's unrelenting. A powerful force that's pushing the land and people to their limits. After a week of desperately trying to save their homes, hands raw, Gatineau residents exhausted. No matter what they do, water keeps pouring in. Homes are engulfed. At least 800 people have left their properties behind. Today, more reached their breaking point. The 
uh, river broke through our in, into our basement. We have no hot water, uh, no heat. It's now becoming even more dangerous to stay. This family experienced what can go wrong firsthand. Their neighbor is in critical condition in hospital. He had been helping build a sandbag wall in front of their home when he tripped over a cable to a 1200 volt pump and fell into electrified water. When I saw him that he was not moving and they were doing this, so oh my God, that this man died for us, you know? Ferris Mirza and another passerby raced to help. She started giving him pumps and I think it was like the 40 or 50th pump. I started breathing him in his mouth. So we both uh, we worked together and she, she led it and, and we saved his life. And he came back. Residents say the army should have been called in long before water levels got this high. Here's how Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale responded to that. The first line of, of responsibility, authority and jurisdiction clearly rests with municipalities and with provinces. The request from uh, Quebec, I think it took uh, exactly 30 seconds uh, for the answer to come and the answer was yes and the same in the case of, of Ontario. Another 300 troops arrived today, joining the 1,200 already in Quebec, and Ontario is getting a quarter million sandbags. Premier Kathleen Wynne visited areas devastated by the flooding that have declared a state of emergency. Once the water subsides, there's going to be a lot of work to, uh, to recover what's been damaged. The government of Canada has told public servants to stay home today and tomorrow. It wants to make sure that bridges and roads are clear for emergency vehicles. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, as you saw, a lot of residents in both Quebec and Ontario have been upset about the response to the flooding, and they've targeted local mayors for their criticism. Montreal Mayor Denny Coderre is the biggest name on that list. We spoke earlier this evening. Mr. Mayor, if we can start with the current situation, there was a sense that cresting of the water could happen tonight or tomorrow. Does it still look that way? And if it does, is the worst over? I think the worst is kind of over because we we peaked at the level of water peaked. So uh, starting tomorrow, it seems that it's going to go lower. So, uh, but uh, there there's a lot of work uh, to be done. So that's why we kept uh, the state of emergency uh, for prevention, of course. But at the same time, we need to rebuild. We need to make sure that all those dikes could uh, stand during that time. And so uh, with our firemen, with the policemen, and and the armed force, we're all working together to uh, make sure that uh, at the same time we protect uh, some of those trees, some of those houses. I imagine you've heard uh, from a lot of those residents because we have, and not just targeting criticism at you, but to other mayors in the region, feeling that, that it was just too slow, the reaction was too slow to getting help to them. It is clearly a, a trauma that they're living. Uh, they are devastating, uh, devastated, sorry, and, uh, you know, very emotional. Uh, they, they feel that they're losing everything. But uh, trust me, everybody was doing the, their job accordingly. Uh, we have a pro, you know, since the ice storm, uh, we, we put forward uh, some of the best practices. Montreal is part of the 100 resilient cities in the world. So uh, we, we, you know, we have a protocol that we're following and uh, everybody's talking to everybody. And so the bottom line from you then is you feel their pain, but you don't think you could have helped any sooner. I think that, uh, you know, it is historical. I mean, you had some places that they didn't have, they didn't see that, and the worst was in 74, and uh, from different zone, never expect to have water there. Uh, even our, our, our own services in uh, Pierrefonds, one of the boroughs, they, they had water in their uh, city hall. So uh, we never expecting that. It, it is truly historical, but of course, we are there not only to prevent, but to, to do uh, uh, the, the best that we could. And, uh, everybody uh, did a tremendous job. You know, just in Montreal, you have over 600 people, Peter, who's working uh, day and night and with all the volunteers and everybody. So, uh, no, I think that uh, there will be an after. We will work with them. We will accompany them. So we are there before, during and after. But uh, clearly, I think that uh, we live something that uh, we never lived before. All right, Mr. Mayor, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Two men are still missing and presumed dead in British Columbia's flood-weary southern interior. One, a local fire chief believed to have been swept away by a swollen river. The other man's home was hit by a mudslide. The weekend rains have tapered off 
easing the situation, but states of emergency remain in some regions. And New Brunswick officials are keeping a close eye on water levels in that province, even though they've been largely spared the disastrous situation next door in Quebec. More rain fell in parts today, but not enough to significantly worsen the swelling of the St. John River. There's been flooding in some areas, but officials are optimistic the water will recede by midweek. Coming up. One of the main reasons I got the car was not to use gas anymore. Then he found his electric car didn't go as far as promised. We investigate why. Plus, homeopathic remedies for kids. The government called for clarity. We see who complied. It hasn't received the widespread attention devoted to the French election, but the past few weeks have seen a tightly waged campaign in Canada as well. It wraps up tomorrow with political judgment day in British Columbia. Chris Brown sets the stage. Nice. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Christy Clark hung out with cargo handlers and posed loading boxes today at Vancouver's airport on a final campaign stop. Where's this going? Oh, nice. If she wins, Clark would become the first Canadian woman ever nice re-elected premier. Ready? But more to the point, she'd have managed to make voters overlook fundraising scandals and a brutal decade-long fight with the province's teachers and, so and instead up. focus on the image of her sticking up for BC. We cannot afford to be weak as a province right now when the Donald Trump government is posing such, such a threat to BC jobs. On the other hand, we've got the threat of two parties, each of which is posing massive tax increases. Very little unexpected has come up to throw Christy Clark off of her campaign stride or her message, which is BC's economy is doing well, so why change? Uh, hi, Christy. One of the few hiccups. I never vote for you because of You don't what? have to. This yeah, brush with a shopper who Clark's campaign accused of being an NDP oh, plant yeah. when she wasn't. Many saw it as a knee-jerk tendency to assign blame before knowing the facts. Still, NDP leader John Horgan hasn't had much luck making the misstep stick. While the party has come close the last three elections, its opposition to big resource projects has been hard to stomach for union members and many in rural BC. Now it's time to bring people together. We can't afford four more years of Christy Clark. That's the message for the next 24 hours, and I think that's a pretty good message. Still, strong support in Metro Vancouver and Vancouver Island could yet give the New Democrats a narrow win. Good, good support out here. Thanks for the for Green Party, Just holding leader Andrew Weaver's seat in Victoria and perhaps picking up a couple of others would be huge. We're the only party that's actually put forward a, 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 an economic plan for the 21st century that builds on our strengths, not our weaknesses. Most polls got the result wrong last time, so this campaign there haven't been many to go by. But the Liberals appear confident, and they could run their winning streak to 16 years and counting. Thank you, Thank you sir. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. The Conservatives renewed their attacks against the Minister of National Defence today. They tabled a motion of no confidence in Harjit Sajjan. The move is non-binding and mostly symbolic. Sajjan faced strong criticism for exaggerating his role in a major military operation in Afghanistan. He has apologized several times. Concern about over-prescribing opioids prompted a new set of guidelines today. A doctor's panel recommends avoiding the drugs as a first-line treatment for chronic non-cancer pain and also suggests gradually weaning a patient off the drugs with lower doses. Canada is the second largest consumer of prescribed opioids. The remains of a First World War soldier found in France six years ago have finally been identified as Canadian. Private Reginald Joseph Winfield Johnson of Manitoba. He's believed to have died in the Battle of Hill 70. Just two months ago, the remains of an Alberta soldier from the same war were identified. Sergeant James Alexander Milne was discovered near Vimy in 2013. It was a decisive victory after a contentious campaign. Emmanuel Macron will soon be France's new president. And those supporters of a united Europe are finally exhaling. The young president-elect still faces profound divisions within his own borders. Nala Ayed is in Paris with more on what comes next. 
stood side by side at the tomb of the unknown soldier, the old and the soon-to-be new president of France, marked victory in Europe Day, the end of the Second World War. Together, they present exactly the image of continuity that critics of the establishment had warned about. With Macron's victory comes a cacophony of expectations for Europe, for France, for solutions to the crisis of confidence in the political system revealed by the record number of abstentions in yesterday's vote. There are questions, perhaps as much about his inexperience as there are about his wife, 24 years his senior and once his schoolteacher. At 39, he's also the youngest president in French history. But he is no stranger to the French, says the deputy director of a newspaper that endorsed him over his far-right rival. He's not like the 39 years old guy of, I can meet in the street. We know him already, because he's just like, I won't say he was elected by the old ones, but in a way he was adopted by the, by the other one. Failing to crack 40% was a big letdown for rival far-right leader Marine Le Pen. Yet video of her dancing after losing last night was widely shared here. And with millions of supporters, her influence plays on. She already has won. She has already won the, the, the she won the mines. But centrist Macron prevailed against the populace. In Paris, though, unions concerned about his reform plans protested, already chanting slogans against the new president. A reminder, many chose him purely to block Le Pen, if at all. With the world watching, France opted for new but familiar. The lingering anxiety about it is a reminder of the multitude of challenges that in time, even victory can bring. Nala Ayet, CBC News, Paris. Days after the Nigerian government negotiated their freedom, the names of dozens of kidnapped young women have been released. A list was published on Twitter and in local papers. Good news for some parents who didn't even know whether their child was among the 82 freed from the grips of Boko Haram. The militant group kidnapped close to 300 schoolgirls in 2014, more than 100 remain missing. Straight ahead, an electric car doesn't go the distance. Why did the car maker say it could? The National with Peter Mansbridge. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Well, we are a long way from our usual cozy studio tonight. It's about 3,000 kilometers that way. This is the Northwest Passage. We're in a shaft of the old syndicate coal mines here in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. These are unusual surroundings for the National. We're about an hour north of Fort McMurray from Stratford, Ontario. In Delta, British Columbia. From Parliament Hill in Saskatoon. Going live off the deck of an icebreaker in Vancouver. From Montreal, once again tonight, a city at the heart of a crisis in the cold. Do you worry about the ice? Yes, I do, yeah. Um, what's gonna happen if it all melts, melts away? Oh, jolly we minor men, and minor men are we. They've all worked the coal mines in Cape Breton. Now they sing to preserve the heritage and the folklore of the island's mining communities. <laughs> Canada is still here tonight, but just barely. Quebecers have voted no to sovereignty. But of course, the story the whole world is watching is the historic switch to the year 2000. This is the day that Winnipeg has been waiting for worrying about, even dreading. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge from downtown Toronto. For the most part, an eerily dark Toronto. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge inside Vatican City. Good evening from the Netherlands, Baghdad. In Tiananmen Square tonight from London. In Vimy Ridge, France. From Kandahar, Afghanistan. Here in Berlin, there's another opening in the wall tonight, number 22. When the waves crashed ashore here and they didn't have far to come, there's the beach line. 
Our ride today is on an Israeli Air Force Black Hawk helicopter. That is the area that the suicide bombers use to get to some of their targets. Look at those. Those are the papal apartments just over on the other side. That's where the Pope lives. As night falls, we're back on the road, moving through the streets of Kandahar, and as always, on the lookout. Thanks for watching. When it comes to national pride, it doesn't get much more Canadian than maple syrup. But ketchup? Not so much. An American company wants to change that. French's has already been bottling up Ontario-grown tomatoes. But now it's taking another big step to target consumers with an all-Canadian product. Jacqueline Hansen has the story. 250 bottles of ketchup per minute, all tomatoes locally sourced, an attempt by underdog Frenches to win over more Canadians. The American company first got a taste of Canadians' patriotism last year. A social media post about French's use of Ontario tomatoes went viral after its much larger rival Heinz shut down its Canadian operations. Now, French's is jostling for attention again. This time, it has moved its ketchup bottling from Ohio to Toronto, a move it hopes will hit home for Canadian consumers. This is local sustainability, you know, affecting your local economy is something that, that proves to be very important to them. The change is also good news for French's new partner, Canadian food manufacturer Select Food Products. We hired 10 full-time new employees, which is great. Select Food Products put millions of dollars into its new ketchup manufacturing line. Well, you know, uh, it's a big bet, um, but I think it's, you know, it's sustainable. So we wouldn't have, have done this if we didn't think that French's was the right partner and that already Canadians were resonating with what they were doing. It's not uncommon for companies to try to tap into patriotism and the idea of buying local to try to market products to Canadians. But experts say there's more required to build a brand that lasts. The price is always going to be important. Marketing fundamentals still stand, but this expert says Canadians look for more. The value that, that companies are bringing to, uh, to products is more about all the things that are behind it. So the emotion, the authenticity, the, the value that thing, the, the things that people value and put a price tag on. Ultimately, though, she says the product has to perform. And in a market where Heinz has long dominated, it may take more than an appetite for supporting the local economy to change Canadians' deeply rooted tastes. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. And to give you a sense of what French's is up against, Heinz is believed to hold about 84% of the ketchup market in Canada. Everyone else is squeezed into that remaining 16%. It's been a bumpy ride for automakers in recent years. Companies have taken heat over inaccurate or misleading performance claims. Now a Toronto man is going public about the car he's been driving. He says BMW oversold the vehicle's efficiency and then quietly changed its advertising. Rosa Marcatelli has the story. When Ron Kleeman took us for a drive in his electric car, it was a short one. Where does it say how far you can go? So right there. 105, so you're yeah. always watching that. Oh yeah to see when you're going to run out of power. Yeah, yeah. A few years ago, he was in the market for a reliable car that was good for the environment. One of the main reasons I got the car was not to use gas anymore. He locked into a four-year lease of a 2014 BMW i3. Right away, he says, he noticed the vehicle couldn't travel the distance on a single battery charge. BMW claimed it could in its online advertising. I remember the car I bought you know, going up to 200 kilometers. He says the vehicle never reached the 200 kilometer distance BMW claimed. And then he found this, Internet archives that show 11 months 
after he ordered the car, the company changed its online marketing material for the i3, reducing that distance from a maximum of 200 to 160 kilometers. That's a 20 percent decrease without notifying owners. Clearly false advertising. BMW Canada won't say why it changed its online ad, but says the vehicles can be significantly impacted by driver behavior, the vehicle's external environment, and the consumption of onboard features. John Volker reports on electric cars. He has a theory about what happened, saying the i3 was first released in Europe, where testing standards in general are more lax. My suspicion is that that 200 kilometers that was in the initial BMW marketing was actually taken directly from European tests. Canada's Competition Bureau investigates claims of false advertising. It won't say if it's investigating BMW, but says in general. If you're going to rely on uh, performance claims, then ensure you have adequate and proper tests in place. There are now more than 30,000 electric vehicles on Canadian roads. A record number of them were sold last year. In this case, BMW offered Ron Kleeman $5,000 towards the purchase of a new new vehicle as a goodwill gesture. He declined that offer, saying he's not interested in another BMW. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. And if you have a story you want our Go Public team to investigate, get in touch. Send an email to gopublic at cbcnews.ca. Now, stay with us for a Canadian success story, sort of. Can you believe you managed to grab this plant? I, I not really. <laughs> An Ontario tech company steps into the big leagues by taking a step away from Canada. Plus, regulations designed for your health. One restaurant pushes back. One industry is under scrutiny. Hi there, Facebook Live fans. Uh, we're on here for the next four minutes. We're live in the uh, commercial break on the television networks, but here at Facebook Live, we're going to uh, have a little fun. We, you know, never got a chance to promote what we were going to do this one tonight, so we don't have any questions. Haven't come in in the last few minutes. If you have one, put one in your comment section of Facebook, and I'll try and answer it. In the meantime, because we've got four minutes to kill, uh, why don't we show you around a little bit in terms of what we got here in the studio? It's the main anchor desk, obviously. That's Al, the floor director, walking around getting things organized for what we're going to be doing when we come out of the commercial break. This is the desk we use uh, for everything, all our different panel discussions like at issue, uh, turning point, the bottom line, they all come off uh, this desk. Uh, Al's standing over by what we call the big wall, and they're framing it up, getting it ready for the Red Sharon uh, piece that we're gonna be doing uh, on the program. Uh, when we come out of this commercial. Uh, John here is playing with his uh, 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 camera, his jib, which can go all over the place, right? He can follow me around, I can be looking into it like this, reading the prompter, or the teleprompter in every one of the cameras. You know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't exactly know how they work, but they work. And they have to work, <laughs> or we're in big trouble. Uh, it's, you know, kind of two-way mirrors and stuff like that. Um, what else can we show around here? We got uh, various different areas that we uh, that we use to uh, show off what we our items that are coming up. This monitor over here. What do we call this one? The 103. Yes, sir. So in other words, it's a 103-inch screen. We use this uh, for ad issue every week uh, when the when Chantel and Andrew and Althea or whoever may be visiting us. Uh, on that time. So this is what it's like when there's no lights. You're lit right, right there, little Peter. If I stand here, I'm lit. Bingo. See, we got little marks all over the floor telling us uh, where to stand when the lights are on. Anyway, that's where we put them. When they can't get here to Toronto, sit around the desk, they go in the, uh, in the 103. All this is for kind of dress. They built this... <laughs> when we moved into this set, we built this kind of little bench around here because somebody said, hey, why don't we have a live audience in the studio every night for the news? And they react to every news item. And then some of us thought, you know, maybe that's not a good idea. But the bench, the bench lasted, but nobody ever gets to sit on it, except me, I just did. I think that's the first time I've sat on it since we built it. How are we doing on time here? Why don't we have a minute 20? 
Minute 10 left. Oh, we got a couple of questions. Uh, Laura Bailey. Hi, Peter. Describe your favorite thing about each province and territory. Seriously? We've got a minute 10. There's 10 provinces, three territories. Love Newfoundland, though. Love Newfoundland. Love them all, but... Uh, uh, who's the lead candidate in the Conservative leadership race? Most of the polls and most of the Conservatives, I would suggest that at this moment, it's Maxime Bernier, but there's a long way to go, you know, in the next couple of weeks, and there are 13 candidates. Don't expect this one to end on the first ballot. Uh, even some of the Bernier people are saying this could go five, six, seven ballots with their guy of course, they're convinced they're going to win on the end, but uh, who knows? 30 seconds. Uh, there were a couple of other questions, and I'm sorry I don't have time to get to them now, but we gave you something a little different tonight, instead of a, a little bit of a sense of the, uh, the place. Well, I've got to get over yes, here. Sir. You have 15 seconds. I've got to get over here to the uh, main wall, the big wall, as we call it, for the intro to Reg's story. So when you see me in uh, five seconds or so, that's All what right. I'll be doing. Okay. Well, as Canada looks past its 150th birthday, we're told future prosperity lies in groundbreaking technology that's conceived here and developed here. The Trudeau government certainly says it supports clean energy. Tonight, we'll show you an Ontario company that for years has quietly worked on leading-edge energy storage. Electrovia is poised to be a global player in a fast-growing industry, lithium-ion batteries. But its shot at the big time is taking shape somewhere else. Red Sharon tells us why. You're back to Toronto tomorrow in the afternoon sometime. Another around the table family discussion. But the Das Guptas are not your typical family. I get in tomorrow uh, about 1.30. Between them, son Raj, daughter Gitanjali, and dad Shankar have doctorates and PhDs from some of the world's most prestigious universities. Places like Stanford and Oxford and Cambridge. We need to act quickly, get uh, establish some significant market share. Together, they run a small company, Electrovia, that they are hoping could join the giants in the business of lithium ion batteries. The key, they say, is that they make some of the cleanest, longest lasting, safest lithium powered batteries at a time when the world can't seem to get enough of them. Smartphones, cars, buses, you name it, a lithium ion battery is probably in something you own. Its business is expected to hit $70 billion within the next five years. They're electrochemical devices. And unlike most lithium ion batteries that produce toxins during manufacturing, theirs does not. It's a clean process and 100% recyclable. Everywhere I look, yeah. I see ideas. Yeah. For over a decade, this adjunct professor from the University of Toronto has been leading this think tank of chemists, engineers, and computer scientists. Because people can walk around and see and say, oops. Uh, yeah. uh, keep the wheels turning. Keep, keep the wheels turning. Yeah. Originally from India, as a young electrochemist, he came to Canada, turning his attention to energy, even sitting for a time on Vice President Al Gore's White House Committee on Climate Change. Burning gasoline uh, is a ridiculous concept. You know, it takes about a million years to uh, have a barrel of that oil. And all we do is burn the thing just to get a little bit of heat out. So it, it, there must be better ways of doing things. Over a decade ago, he decided to focus on batteries, but it hasn't been easy. You could fire a cannon in here and not hit anybody. Oh, right now, <laughs> yeah, we could. Electrovia's large production plant echoes with the projects that have gone before. It's become a museum of sorts. So this is part of the early days. Of Partnerships with Microsoft in consumer electronics. So that's a 16-year-old machine, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> and Chrysler. So that would be able to move a truck around? Yep. There have been partnerships with NASA, developing things like batteries for spacesuits and with utilities in the United Kingdom. Okay. This is one of the world's first distributed microgrids. 
So they're down here somewhere? Oh, there they are. Then, of course, there was Electrovia's foray into the world of electric cars. Yeah, it was, a, it was a nice drive, as I recall. Electrovia helped build the first lithium-ion-powered vehicles in both North America and Europe, partnering with giant companies like Tata of India. And five years ago, even building their own electric vehicle. If I put my foot down, this thing would hop. But, they say, government bureaucracy, very thin profit margins, and a very competitive auto sector stalled those plans. I guess we should have checked to make sure this thing was charged up. So this was the original production area for cells. Five years later, it's much quieter in here. But the work continues. Sales are on the way up, and they are now more convinced than ever they're right on the edge of big things. Not just, they say, because their technology is still the best, but because they have a new partner, one that may have brought a game changer to the table in the form of this. It may not look like much, but... This is the magic that yes. changed everything, really. Yeah. 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 This is the ceramic material. Correct. This is a fully embedded ceramic material. What you're really looking for is thermal stability. Right. And uh, next thing you know, there's massive flames shooting out of the... Thermal stability and some lithium-ion batteries have become an issue. Whether it's smartphones... Wow, I can feel the heat in here. ...or electric cars or buses, increased electrical density packing more power into smaller cells increases the risk of fires. As energy density of these lithium-ion batteries are getting higher and higher, the safety is becoming a, a, a problem. It's a real smart system. The key going forward, Nudas Gupta, was a way to increase battery power and production without compromising safety. And he found that solution not here, but an ocean away. In Germany, just outside of Dresden, sits Litharian, built by Daimler AG and Evonik Industries, two giants in German business. It is the largest lithium-ion battery manufacturing plant in Europe. And the giants were about to shut it down. Strict European environmental standards made their toxic production process too expensive. That is, until Shankar Dasgupta convinced them his clean battery production technology could save it. Can you believe you managed to grab this plant? I, I, not really. <laughs> if you had to build this, what would it cost? Oh, it, it would have taken years and probably a few hundred million dollars. After looking at Electrovia's clean technology, to save the giant German plant, they agreed to sell to Dasgupta for just one million euro. Electrovia's clean production technology will reduce the German plant's costs by up to 30% while giving Electrovia up to 10 times the production output. And Litarian brought its technology to the table, that ceramic separator that makes more powerful batteries much safer. So I think this was a perfect match. Dr. Jörg Reim is the plant's chief technical officer. The Tarion one and this is a competitor one. Okay. To prove his point, Dr. Reim set up a small heating demonstration. These thin strips called ceramic separators are the difference between new energy-dense batteries operating safely or ending up like this. If you go above a certain threshold, then nothing can, can hold the battery there. And this is what our separator prevents, to come above the certain threshold. On the left is their separator. The competition's is on the right. 135, and, and look at the difference. So what you can see here already, our ceramic separator, the Parion, is still totally unaffected. Electrovia has picked up the global rights to this technology, along with the state-of-the-art plant and all the supporting research and development Dr. Reim's team supplies. When we heard about the new process, what kind of advantages we have in terms of 
um, financial things, also so cost, but environmental aspects, so we are very enthusiastic. And as the plant is being retooled to use Electrovia's production technology... And I'm quite sure this contact um, will give us some more possibilities and opportunities. To... This new global partnership is focusing away from automotive to much bigger applications where profit margins are higher. And this is a real huge market. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about the pollution in Tokyo and all these big cities, but you have it in front of the door. Yes, and the market is yeah, growing and growing and growing. Germany is already arguably further down the path of the green revolution than many countries, committed to reducing carbon dioxide output by at least 80% by 2050. When it comes to lithium-ion batteries, that means besides cars, powering trains, buses, delivery vans, energy storage units, even giant forklifts and selling not just the batteries, but the intelligent systems engineering that makes them run efficiently. What they really, really need is engineering services. Mm. By his own admission, Shankar Das Gupta is a scientist, not a businessman. As they fight for sales, finding working capital continues to be a struggle. We're making immediate investments to support clean tech research and development. He's glad the government is now talking the talk, but he says to date, government support in building this industry at home has never really materialized. Does it bother you that this isn't happening in Canada? It, 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 it does. It does. Ultimately, it does. And uh, But technology is, is something that has no geography yeah. and no nationality either. Having the chance to make this plant work is a world-class opportunity. But failure is never far from his mind. If we cannot get the financing done, we will probably disappear. Electrovia will probably disappear. But the technology will be alive. And that's more important to me. And, and the technology will be alive probably in Germany because this is where they'll support it. From personal experience, Shankar Dasgupta knows it takes much more than a great product to succeed. It will also take a bit of luck. But knowing all that, still, if you ask him the question, is this that good luck? Is this it? His answer? This is it. Red Sharon, CBC News, near Dresden, Germany. And Reg is working on another story from Germany. How tall is that? It's um, 149 meters. He'll show you a farm town that's self-sufficient in energy. You'll see how it's done in the days ahead on The National. Coming up, the limits of consumer protection. Companies don't always comply even when they're told flat out they have to. Here's a look at the day's business numbers. The TSX rose 70 points. The dollar was up slightly. In New York, the Dow rose five points. The price of oil was up 21 cents a barrel. Leonard uh, Cohen is a Canadian poet, novelist, and despite an air of frail vulnerability, he's a very confident young man. I feel free when I'm singing. Do you make up your own songs? Hmm. I uh, always thought of myself as a singer and uh, kind of got sidetracked into literature. Can you sing? Well, I think that if the song is really good and it's your own, then uh, what comes out is music. But now another stranger seems to want you to ignore his dreams as though they were the burden of another. Oh, yes. Well, I'd feel pretty lousy if I were praised by uh, a lot of the people that have uh, come down pretty heavy on me. Cannot stand what I become You much prefer the gentleman I was before well, I always felt that my work was more eccentric and uh, that uh, if it touched the mainstream from time to time, I would be lucky. I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel You were famous, your heart was a legend Mr. Leonard Cohen! 
It's only in a country like this that I could get the male vocalist of the year. Well, I don't know. People have called me the pessimistic, you know, but I, I think the pessimist is someone who's, who's waiting for it to rain. You know, and I, I feel completely soaked to the skin. So... <laughs> it's closer time. Sometimes I see myself in the midst of it, or I catch sight of myself in the mirror, you know, this old guy in his underwear, you know, kind of trying to find the rhyme for orange and, uh, you know, playing the same phrase on his guitar 15, 20, 90 times, trying to get it right. And there's something uh, uh, absurd about that, but, uh, you know, the nature of work is repetition. And do you come up with a rhyme for orange? Uh, um, door hinge. Two stories now from the health and safety beat. The restaurant food you eat and that you feed your kids and what you give them when they're sick. Decisions with important enough consequences that governments have brought in new regulations. But are they working or being followed? First up, Christine Birak with calorie counts on Ontario menus. Mealtime in Ontario comes with a side of calorie counts. Sit-down or fast food chains with more than 20 outlets must post the number of calories you need each day and the number of calories in each item they sell. So far, most businesses are complying. Almost, except one chain that we are, you know, we are having a challenge with that the province is aware of. One chain that hasn't posted calories is Freshie. Freshie markets itself as a healthy alternative to fast food. Hello. So why isn't it posting calories on menu boards? Freshie did not respond to CBC News requests for an interview, but its website states our motto is count nutrients, not calories. If you think that the calories being listed would, would scare off customers, then, then you might not want to list them. Using the nutritional information posted on the company's website, we asked a registered dietitian to help us digest a freshy bowl. With brown rice, kale and beans, it gets top marks for ingredients, but high in sugar and salt. Total calories, 640. With that 640, it's 105 grams of carbohydrates. So that's the equivalent of about seven pieces of bread. Nutrient-dense foods can be higher in calories, a fact other chains serving fresh, wholesome foods also contend with. From the beginning, Aroma always offered half sandwiches. Aroma Espresso Bar offers half portions of some dishes and says Freshy isn't playing fair. I don't understand why a brand that touts its freshness and touts the nutritional value of its, of its food wouldn't want to make their information more readily available to its customers. Uh, to me, it's a no-brainer. Experts say one problem calorie counts are trying to tackle is overeating. Healthy or not, too many calories still lead to weight gain. Toronto Public Health says it's now issuing warnings, but Freshie could face fines of up to $10,000 a day. Christine Virac, CBC News, Toronto. When kids get coughs and colds, there are lots of over-the-counter choices, and many parents reach for products marked as natural. Health Canada has been paying attention to how those are labeled. 
but are companies that market them complying? Our marketplace colleague, David Common, has that story. When Shannon Alley has a sick kid, she turns to a homeopathic cough and cold remedy. I prefer an all natural, something that's a little more from nature. And she figures if the box is on the same shelf as pharmaceuticals like Tylenol or Advil, it must meet the same scientific standard. I would think that they're both the same if they're both being sold sort of in the same section, because um, they're usually not too far away from each other. But in reality, homeopathic products don't need to prove they work the way over-the-counter drugs do. Though a Health Canada survey found two-thirds of Canadians believe they do. And the agency says that's a problem. What we want to achieve, and that's what we're consulting on, is making sure that products that have specific claims are supported by a similar level of evidence. It certainly isn't like that yet. Two years ago, CBC Marketplace created this fake natural product and got it licensed. Health Canada never required scientific evidence that it did what it claimed. Effective relief from fever, pain and inflammation in kids. Soon after our broadcast, a new safety alert from the government aimed at homeopathic products, no longer allowing companies to make specific health claims for cough, cold and flu for children 12 and under, unless those claims are supported by scientific evidence. To many, it looked like a new guideline, meaning the labels would have to change. No more words like effective relief. The change was expected this March. But take a tour of the shelves now, and there's almost no change. Just one brand we found has this note, not based on modern science. This is deceptive. This doctor thinks that changes don't do much to help consumers. You know, the, the, the biggest text on this is cough. This is for cough. And so the average person will probably see nothing more than this relieves cough. That's the perception Health Canada was challenging. But the homeopathic industry pushed back. In a letter sent five months ago and obtained by CBC, it fought to keep its label claim, suggesting that addition of information to pediatric labels, such as the note that products aren't based on modern science, would be preferable to the removal of information. The letter suggests Health Canada agreed. And the agency says 98% of homeopathic brands are complying, but it relies on what those brands tell them, rather than verifying what's actually in stores. When we looked over the past week, three of the four top brands have made no change at all. I'm left thinking that we haven't solved this problem at all and um, that the government needs to act and Im implement some regulations and enforce them and not just talk about it. This wouldn't be the only example of things that we find on the shelf that, to use your words, say cough and cold mm -hmm. that suggests relieves dry cough, relieves congestion. It's clearly marketed mm -hmm. at kids well, zero to nine. In, in those cases, we want to have that information to provide us the details and we'll look at that. So we asked the industry, why have most labels not been changed? Phil Waddington is the top lobbyist for Canada's homeopathic products. Within the retail level, if the, products haven't, if the old products haven't sold off, then that's why you'll find some of the products on the market now that still have the old labels. They're still compliant with the regulations, but the new labeling changes that we've agreed to and are, and are putting into place may not, have, may not have made it to the shelves yet. For every non-prescription drug product on the market, there are 20 natural health products on the market, many of which look indistinguishable from those drug products. Is Health Canada backing down here? One hopes not, but you always worry about the influence of lobby groups and, and big businesses, and there's no question that the natural health products industry is a multi-billion dollar industry with lots of influence. And smart marketers. We asked one brand if they were in compliance. They sent us their new label. Doesn't look that different, but look closely down there at the bottom, suitable for kids older than 12. And so, over the age targeted by Health Canada, thus exempt from their demands. I would totally bought this. Now that Mom Shannon knows all this, she's planning a change. But I think now, just based on my own thinking and now that I'm talking it out, I probably should just be getting the ones that are scientifically proven to make them feel better. 
It's about having the relevant information, something Health Canada was insisting should be in front of Canadian parents. David Coleman, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. Up next, an old Blue Jay brings down the house. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, LED lights are being touted as both an energy saver and economical in the long term. But flooding street lights with LEDs are shutting out the night sky. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. Each working day of the year throughout Canada, the post office handles about 10 million pieces of mail. The men who face the gigantic task of sorting this mass of mail must know the names of 13,000 cities, towns, and villages in Canada. In the last decade, its reputation for quick, dependable service has been smashed by literally hundreds of labor disturbances. Its deficit has risen to an astonishing $600 million a year, and its automation program is so far behind schedule, no one can estimate when it'll be finished. Canadians are losing patience. They're increasingly fed up, and so am I. The post office will become a crown corporation. In rural communities across Canada, the post office is more than a place to buy stamps and pick up your mail, and this one is no exception. It's, it's really the center of the village. But Canada Post says it loses money. These new super boxes will replace Vernon Dunlop. There's no contact with an, uh, an aluminum box and a key. We want to have a community life. About 30 groups of angry residents from across Canada kicked off a national campaign today to get rid of super mailboxes. Ann Derrett lives in Markham, just north of Toronto. She doesn't get home mail delivery. Every weekday, either she or her husband trudges about 100 meters to the neighborhood mailbox. Derrett hates that trek so much, she helped found RAM residents against mailboxes. Ram Mulrooney mailboxes. Well, the post office delivered something today it hasn't been able to for 30 years, a profit. Canada Post says it made almost $100 million in the past year and it expects even bigger profits in the future. Canadians are making fewer trips to the mailbox. This is the main culprit, email, now as mainstream as a Hollywood blockbuster movie convincing the millions of Canadians who use it to come back to so-called snail mail won't be easy. Why would I want to mail a letter and post it and go to the mail to the mailbox? Why? Big change for many Canadians. The end of home mail delivery in urban centers. On doorsteps across the country today, there came plenty of reaction to the big changes at Canada Post. I like to have things delivered and everyone cuts back and it's so silly. Like the milkman a generation or more ago, the days of daily visits from your friendly letter carrier will soon seem like a quaint notion from another era. The National. The National. Tonight. I'm Sanjay Saran of Delhi to Dublin from Vancouver. We tour all over the world, but like anywhere I've gone, and I've seen some pretty awesome things, my favorite place in the whole world is Vancouver. Last fall, after more than seven seasons, Edwin Encarnacion left the Toronto Blue Jays as a free agent. Tonight, fans got the chance to show him how they feel now as he stood at the plate for the visitors. That's pretty warm, nice to see you again. But for a real welcome home, you should see what's happened on remote Ackle Island in Western Ireland. Until 1984, this rocky patch was a sandy beach, but a violent storm washed it all away. Then, just last month, another storm, and suddenly the sand was back. 
a sight for sore Irish eyes, and quite the change for any returning visitors. That's the Nationals Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.